I'm the love Liz, welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. If you're first time here, well I release content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, so if you like crime and consistency then I am your girl. Also to everyone who wants my merch, I'm releasing it so you'll be able to get things like Kenny's Crime Cult. <laughs> you know, wear them because secretly I am starting a cult. I'm just convincing you it's not a cult so that when you buy the merch and start wearing things saying Kenny's Crime Cult and you're in a cult, you won't even know you're in a cult. But I'll know you're in a cult. Anyway, more serious issues. Thank you to everybody who's following me on Patreon. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got a cult podcast coming up. I've got a barrister who used to try criminal cases coming up. I've got, obviously, my undercover agent who speaks regularly on my podcast. So I'm hoping that you're enjoying it. It blows my mind when I do that and the fact that these professionals and individuals want to come and talk about their lives. It is so exciting to listen to all these different adventures that people have been on, both good and bad. Today's case is going to be one that I think may divide opinion because there has been so much coverage of it in the press. And because it's really recent, I wanted to kind of jump on this before the whole of the web is flooded with people covering it. And I'm going to try to be neutral as far as possible. You all know there's a little bit of me that is judgy. So therefore, I can't always promise that I will be completely without bias, but I'm trying my best. Now, the case is Kyle Rittenhouse. It's been everywhere. And there have been so many myths about this case and so much prejudice drummed up within this that I'm going to try my best to give you the facts and then you can do with those facts what you wish, including the court notes and all of the things that help me to tell this story. I think it's so important when there has been a really inflammatory case in the press that we understand that the press, well, the press lie. And I could give you a million examples of that, including myself being in the press with lies. But if you're not aware of that and you just take things verbatim, it can mean that you have a lot of opinions that are completely understandable, but that are not based in truth. So today what I'm going to do is explore this case based in truth. The trial was in November. It ignited debates all over the US. And basically the main debate was around race relations, gun violence and vigilantism. Everybody has their own viewpoints about vigilantism. In the UK, we have a lot of individuals who procure paedophiles to come and meet young people that aren't young people. They're just set ups so that that individual can be challenged about their behavior. It divides opinion constantly. Some people see it as a retribution of moral behavior and a willingness to put people on the line to bring these people to justice. But then on the other side, you have a lot of people like the police who find it really, really unhelpful and actually can contribute to violence. Because when you think about people like paedophiles, they also have daughters, sons, parents, and it invites negativity and hostility towards those people. Like I said, I'm just bringing the balance in there. There are two sides to each story and the reactions to those stories. So this trial followed events in Kenosha, which is on the western shore of Lake Michigan. This is an old automotive Wisconsin city, and it's only got 100,000 people. Now, the story really begins on the 23rd of August 2020. This is shortly after 5 p.m. The police in Kenosha respond to a domestic incident at the 2800th block of 40th Street outside a fourplex. The caller was Lucretia Booker, and she is the fiance of 29 year old African American Jacob Blake. Blake has been staying at the fourplex with Lucretia, and the couple have got several children together. That day, was the eldest son's eighth birthday. So they were celebrating his son's birthday together. Blake had actually decorated the apartment for a party. He was cooking hot dogs. And then, as happens in relationships, particularly under stressful events, Lakeisha and him start to have an argument. We've all done it. You know you have. So he leaves the fourplex in a rental car, but he doesn't actually get permission from her to do that. He then comes back. There's obviously quite a lot of friction at this moment in time, but he basically won't give her the keys back. 
He's then planning on driving away again, but this time he's got the kids. And Blake also has a warrant out for his arrest from July, and these are for alleged offences against Lakeisha. He's been charged with third degree sexual assault, trespassing, and disorderly conduct in connection with domestic abuse. This is stemmed from the year before when she'd returned from a party, gone to bed, and she woke to find Blake standing over her. He allegedly inserted one of his fingers in her vagina, smelled it and said, it smells like you've been with other men. She was in the same room as a child when this occurred, and he'd then taken her car and left. That is completely reprehensible behaviour, we can all agree. It doesn't matter whether you're in a relationship with somebody or otherwise, you cannot put your hands on them without permission, and certainly it gives us some insight into some of the issues in their relationship. There's obviously a high degree of jealousy there. That is out and out, completely inappropriate behaviour per se. It also wasn't the first time that Blake had allegedly assaulted her. He did have a history of alcohol problems, and we can all agree that when you have an issue with alcohol, often you do not act in your best behaviour when you're under the influence. In 2012, he was also charged with battery and the endangering of a life of a child. Allegedly, he tried to choke Lucretia, and she fell while she was holding a baby son from a previous relationship. So the responding officers who attend on the day that they're arguing are aware of this outstanding warrant on Blake. So the Kenosha Police Department's policy is when you get somebody who has some kind of pending issue, you detain them if they've got a felony warrant. So essentially, with that outstanding issue, that's going to be a behaviour that they carry out. Now, there are real conflicting accounts about what actually happened when the officers arrived on that scene. The incident was actually videoed by a neighbour, but because there were vehicles around the incident, a lot of it's obscured by those vehicles, sadly. But eyewitnesses stated that there were this group of women who were basically arguing on the street when Blake pulls up in his car. According to some, he didn't even get involved. Now, according to others, he did he attempted to break up the fight between the women. At this point, three white police officers arrive on the scene and their intention is to arrest Blake on this outstanding warrant. Now, unfortunately, Kenosha officers do not wear body cams. That's a shame because I think even though a lot of us hate living in the CCTV footage world, the truth is if you have a police officer come near you, you want them to be wearing a body cam because if their behaviour falls short, at least there is some evidence that that's the case. If that isn't available, then often, with respect, rightly or wrongly, what will happen is the police will tell a story and the individual who rebuffs that story will be seen as the one making it up, even if they're actually telling the truth. So these police officers later state that Blake was immediately physically aggressive with them. He also repeatedly refused to be detained. One of the officers, that was a seven-year veteran, Rustin Shesky, they claimed he saw Blake place a child in his fiancée's SUV. She apparently then tells the officers that Blake has her kids and her car keys. At this point, some scuffle breaks out and allegedly Blake goes and gets one of the officers in a headlock, which would be completely inappropriate and clearly would put the officer at threat and would result in other officers responding and reacting. And apparently they unsuccessfully attempt multiple times to subdue him with a taser, and this has no effect. I mean, I've seen people tasered, and most of the time it seems to have a really big impact, but okay, we'll acknowledge that maybe the adrenaline was coursing through him to a point where he could override a taser, but nonetheless, this is the story that is told. So police then claim that Blake was armed with a knife in his left hand. They tell him to put the weapon down. They shout, drop the knife. And apparently he ignores the commands and continues to be really aggressive. And then he turns and appears to reach in through the driver's side door of the SUV. According to Shesky, he then whips around his body and drives the knife towards his body. Now, at this point, Shesky opens fires. Fires seven shots at point-blank range. Hits Blake four times in the lower back and three times in the left side. He claimed 
He believed that Blake was going to attempt to stab him and to abduct his children. So he was determined essentially not to let him leave. Now, eyewitnesses stated that Blake was not the aggressor. In fact, the eyewitnesses said it was very much the police who were the aggressor in this situation. They also said that he was not armed with a knife and later scrutiny of video footage would actually confirm that he was holding a knife. In fact, the knife was later recovered from the driver's side front floorboard of the SUV. And the location of the bullet wounds were also consistent with him turning towards Shesky. Now, Blake did later admit that he did have possession of a knife, but that he was absolutely not intending to use it. In fact, he said at that moment in time, he just simply wasn't thinking clearly, which I think we can all have some empathy and sympathy for Blake here. I'm not saying if he was resisting arrest, etc., that this was something that was a positive thing to do with armed police. It clearly isn't. But he's been in a situation where he's rowed with his wife, everything's got inflamed and escalated, suddenly the police are there, it's gone from a birthday to a position where he's going to be removed and put into prison. And these things are very emotional experiences, aren't there? So I do think we have to acknowledge that he probably wasn't thinking that clearly. But it's a, probably a big jump to assume that he was going to try to kill some police officers. You know, I think that the likelihood is at this moment in time, he is just not knowing how to act in this moment because of all the adrenaline and worry and fear and confusion. Nonetheless, not a good idea to be armed in any way, shape or form when there are police officers with guns near you, particularly in the States, because with respect, they have a right to shoot you and you don't want to put yourself in a position of being seriously harmed. And again, I'm not blaming Blake at all. I'm just saying that if you were linear wise thinking straight, you would think this is probably not a good thing to do because people end up dead, unfortunately, and very often dead in certain situations that they didn't deserve to at all. So Blake gets critically injured in this shooting and initially he's paralyzed from the waist down. Now he is slowly learning to walk again, but I mean, that must've been terrifying for him to find himself in a situation, you know, he's got all these kids and, you know, he's living a family life, albeit imperfect, and then suddenly he's completely immobile. That must be absolutely devastating. Blake also had a gunshot wound to his arm, damage to his stomach, kidney and liver. And to put that in context as well, just as how serious this was, he had to have most of his small intestines and colon removed. That is severely life-limiting injuries for the rest of his life, if you just think about those major areas that were affected. Now, the shooting occurred in front of Blake's three children. They were all in the backseat of the SUV at the time. He was shot within three minutes of the officers arriving at that scene. That's a short amount of time, isn't it, for that situation to play out? And it makes you consider the intention of the individuals who turned up to deal with him because were they having this bias that they were going to meet some kind of violent incident and therefore they were almost ready immediately to use their guns or the tasers? Seems like a lot of escalation in a short amount of time with the man ending up very seriously injured. He actually got hospitalised for six weeks. Now, ultimately, following in-depth investigation, no charges were filed against Officer Shevsky. Now, again... Chances are that they did a thorough investigation and he was just acting in accordance to, as far as they're concerned, the rights that officers have. And they couldn't prove he hadn't acted in self-defense and he did return to active duty in April this year. But it really did spark a nationwide Black Lives Matter protest because they felt that there was racial injustice this was like previous protests that had began because of incidents that were reprehensible, including George Floyd, who was murdered by police officer Derek Chauvin, who basically knelt on his neck. I'm sure a lot of us are aware of that because it just went worldwide. And the reaction to that was one of horror. And let's be honest, George Floyd was certainly not your picture poster of a perfect citizen. Absolutely not. And, you know, we have to be realistic about who he was and his actions, but he should never have found himself in a scenario where he was basically murdered in public by a police officer and a police officer is the one in power and in those situations it was a complete misuse of that power dynamic also elijah mclean 
That was an unarmed 23 year old, violently restrained, given ketamine and subsequently suffered a cardiac arrest. Breonna Taylor, she was a medical worker and she got fatally shot during a police raid on her apartment. So there was a lot of feelings of anger, rage and injustice about the way that black people in general were being treated by the police. Now the BLM movement had focused attention on racial inequality, specifically the use of unnecessary or excessive, often fatal force, by law enforcement on black people. However, these demonstrations seem to inflame far white supremacists. So more and more legal militia groups had formed in response to these left wing rallies. And when the news of this shooting came out, hundreds of protesters gathered to get together to protest against it. And violence and rioting seemed to follow very quickly. Property and vehicles were vandalized. Buildings were burned down. This included state probation and parole offices. There were armed robberies on local businesses. Windows were smashed. Businesses were looted and set on fire. The protesters constantly clashed with the police. And in fact, the police responded by firing tear gas and rubber bullets into the crowds. And officers were also injured. And that's a very emotive issue when police officers who are there to serve and protect get hurt, there is usually quite a big reaction because of the fact that individuals feel very angry that people who are actually working for the protection of the general public are actually becoming recipients of harm because of the general public. And again, just trying to be neutral, I'm a massive believer in protesting. I really am, but I don't believe in violent protests at all. In fact, there is really interesting research on protesting per se, and the required amount of peaceful protesters who, if they refuse to act in a certain way or go on the streets and keep protesting, you only need 3.5% of the population to change the system completely. And I mean to overthrow tyrannical systems, to overthrow dictatorships. If 3.5 people out of 100 people say no, it doesn't matter how hard people push in the powers that be, they will always fail. Just one for your little memory banks there. If you feel powerless and you're thinking, I want some changes to happen in the world, but no one else seems to want to. There's only a few people I know who seem to feel the same way. Well, as long as there's three or four people who feel the same way, it's a good indication that if you just start lobbying, canvassing, connecting with others, you'll be able to bring down any, and I mean any, organisation or power. And that's a really heartening thing. We often lose sight of the fact that power of the people is something that we should always be aware of. And peaceful protests are the ones that have the biggest impact. Why? The more inclusive, disabled people can go, children can go, women can go. This means that you won't just have that young demographic of people who go out rioting. It's so much more healthy. Just to put it out there, protests work, but peaceful ones are the way forward. But nonetheless, these do get very violent. Now, at some point, an older man with a fire extinguisher confronts rioters and he gets retaliation. So he gets struck with a hard object and it splits his nose and it breaks his jaw. At this point, Kenosha County declare an overnight emergency curfew. So the state of emergency is declared the next day, 24th of August. 125 National Guard members are drafted in to guard against looting and vandalism and also to protect firefighters who are also coming under attack. And against this backdrop, some local residents think, okay, we need to get together to defend local businesses. Former Kenosha Alderman Kevin Mathewson posts a message on his Kenosha Guard Militia Group on his Facebook page. So he's founded the Kenosha Guard Militia following the riots after George Floyd's death. And he decides that the police need some civilian reinforcement. He was also known with respect to sometimes bring a handgun to city council meetings. Jesus, what were you expecting at the city council meeting? What protection were you requiring? Who was coming to get you? Were you just very stern about the kind of policies you wanted to be implemented? We are going to implement this, aren't we, with your gun? Anyway, now he posts this message on Facebook calling for patriots willing to take up arms and to defend Kenosha from evil thugs. Quite a lot of prejudice in that, but nonetheless, you kind of also get that feeling that this is a guy who's genuinely invested in protecting his community, albeit 
a little bit on steroids when it comes down to the personal responsibility. But then he does take handguns to meetings at the council. So he tells people to meet him outside the courthouse at 6 p.m. and thousands of people expressed interest. Many replies included comments such as kill looters and rioters. Probably not the kind of people who need to turn up, but it gives you an indication, doesn't it, of that subtext of rage. Now, subsequently, because of that message, lots of non-locals descend on Kenosha. And it's a real mix of people with respect. You've got the right-wing militants in camouflage. You've got the left-wing activists. You've got BLM activists, anti-fascists who are wearing black block clothing. Lots of them had weapons. Some openly, some had them concealed. You know, this is a perfect ingredient for a pressure cooker situation just to explode. And some described the militia as LARPERS. That's people into live action role playing games. Okay? So LARPERS. People into live action role playing games. But with respect, guys, this is real life, real weapons real potential for horrific harm. Anyway, Matthewson, he turns up at the courthouse to meet his Kenosha guard and he's wearing a Chuck Norris t-shirt and is armed with a semi-automatic rifle. It really terrifies me that we have things like AK-47s. I know that they aren't the same as machine guns, but the fact that they fire so fast, even though it's individual bullets, means that it's desperately dangerous. And just to be having those and walking around the streets, it gives me chills. Mostly because I think if I'd had access to one of those as a teenager, a lot of people I know might have been dead. I had a real issue with impulse control and anger when I was a kid. I'm just saying, it's not necessarily good that people can have access to these things. With respect, I know to my American viewers, you have the Second Amendment and you have a right to bear arms. I appreciate it. I also think, in current circumstances, that I have a better understanding now of why that was brought in. And even though I think that guns have become far stronger and more damaging than they were in the time that that Second Amendment was passed, I kind of get that people who are powerfully and at times unfairly controlled by the state need to be able to show the state consequences if they are under threat. So I kind of get it more now, but nonetheless it does scare me because I think you have to have a level of control to handle a gun and also you have to be a really peaceful person because otherwise you might find yourselves in situations of conflict because of your personality that means that you feel that you have a right stroke duty to actually use your gun. However, this is where we're at in this point of time and Matthewson is obviously at a scenario where he feels like he needs to protect his community and get people around him to do the same. So Matthewson doesn't actually stay at the courthouse very long. And we also know from looking at the Facebook post that people had continued to post some really inflammatory comments on Facebook. Facebook did actually later take down the Kenosha Guard site because it violated its policy regarding militia organizations. However, it had initially allowed the page to stand even after receiving well over 400 complaints. One of the individuals who answers the call that this guy put out was 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse. He wasn't even local, so he wasn't even a resident of the state of Wisconsin. He actually lived in Antioch, Illinois, and he'd basically driven 20 miles to get there. Carl Rittenhouse lived with his mother, Wendy, and his sisters, Faith and Mackenzie. It's also worth noting that his father, Mike, struggled with alcohol addiction and there had been allegations of domestic violence at the home. His parents had finally separated and it's also worth noting that they struggled quite a lot financially. So it wasn't really easy for Carl Rittenhouse. He was a student at Lakes Community High School, but he didn't graduate and he worked as a fry cook and a janitor to help with cash and he enrolled in an online school. He was also a former member of a youth police cadet program and there are social media images showing him participating in police explorers program for teenagers. It's kind of like aimed at teaching life skills to youths with challenging home, social or school lives. He participated in similar cadet programs through Antioch Fire Department he also was known to often wear his cadet uniform around his apartment complex where he lived with his mother, 
which kind of indicates that he felt really proud of that. And I think when you haven't got a lot of money, you also have to think of the fact that uniforms give you a space and place to belong and you can wear them with people respecting that uniform. Whereas if you don't have access to great finances, dressing in fashionable clothes can be a problem. So uniforms can be a real lifesaver in these kind of circumstances and psychologically really, really beneficial. It was very clear to his family that he wanted to become a police officer or a paramedic. And in 2020, he did unsuccessfully try to join the Marines. But you can see, can't you, running through him, he has this desire to serve. He has the desire to belong to an organisation who are involved in protecting the general public. And also, I would imagine, to have that level of respect and to be seen as a contender in life. You know, if you've had lots of problems in your experiences growing up, then just standing out for the right reasons can be psychologically very powerful to you. And it's there, we can see this in Cal Rittenhouse's behavior. Additionalizing his support for these kind of services and just showing you how engaged he was with it, he even expressed support on social media for Blue Lives Matter movement and for law enforcement. In fact, his Facebook was very pro-police. He was constantly praising law enforcement. And there was also a picture of him on social media holding an assault rifle. Also images of him cheering for Trump in the front row at a campaign rally. But in spite of the fact that people can make some assumptions about him at this point, and people will and did, there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever of any far right white supremacist images or any materials that associated him with the far right at all. Not one. And this is a kid who knows how to post on social media and has an absolute connection with the forces and totally wants to be part of protection. But even though he likes Trump, even though he's been at rallies and all of the things that go with that, there is no material linking him with any far right or white supremacist connections at all. So Rittenhouse had absolutely no known links to such groups and also absolutely no evidence of extremism. Also, it's worth noting that compared to many other states, Illinois, which is Rittenhouse's home state, has pretty strong firearm laws. Now, on the 24th of August, he's finished work. He's just secured a job as a lifeguard, having recently qualified. So he drives from Illinois to his friend's house. That's 18-year-old Dominic Black. They become really close friends after Black started dating Rittenhouse's sister. Now, Black would later state that he considered Rittenhouse a brother. He saw him nearly every day. They were really close friends. Black had purchased a Smith & Wesson semi-automatic rifle for Rittenhouse four months previously in May 2020. There is a problem here because Rittenhouse is only 17 and you have to be 18 to purchase a gun in the state of Illinois legally. Also, with respect to his mother, she wouldn't allow guns in the house. So in Black's home state of Wisconsin, you also need to be 18, but Black's old enough. So he can actually purchase semi-automatic rifles. It is, however, an offense to supply somebody under the age of 18 with any kind of weapon of this manner. Rittenhouse is only 17. But for whatever reason, during a trip to Black's family hunting property in May 2020, Black agrees to buy a rifle for Rittenhouse and he uses Rittenhouse's money to make the purchase. Black then keeps the rifles locked in a gun safe at his house. Only his stepfather, in fact, is allowed to open the safe. So when the gun had initially arrived, they'd shot around 200 rounds together, but this would literally be the only time Rittenhouse would fire the rifle until the events of 25th of August. And I'm saying that because again, yes, Black has acted illegally and stupidly with respect. You just shouldn't do something that can have catastrophic effects and impact for you. But I think we can all agree that many of us have had people provide us with things that we shouldn't have had when we were younger than we should have been. Is it just me? I was provided with many things that I should not have legally been allowed to have under the age of 18 at around 14, for example. So what I'm getting across is, again, it's very easy to judge people, but there is a natural curiosity and inquisitive nature of human beings. And certainly with somebody like Rittenhouse, who clearly wants to be in the forces and wants to be somebody of meaning, having a gun would have been seen as a rite of passage. Black and him are incredibly close. Yes, it's wrong, but I can see why that behavior occurs. So the morning of the 25th of August, 2020, Rittenhouse, Black, and Black's brother go downtown. They want to 
witness the aftermath of the first two nights of rioting following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. The photos that you'll see, they show him cleaning graffiti off a high school nearby the Kenosha County Courthouse, for example. So he's there to be pro-social at this moment in time. Later, he returns to Black's home. Black's friend, Nick Smith, suggests that they could help protect Car Source, which is this auto dealership where Smith formerly worked and it had been very badly vandalized. And that actual dealership was owned by an Indian American family. The previous night, dozens of cars had been set on fire. A mob had descended on the lot and they'd begun smashing at cars. The final damage with respect to that car lot was estimated at $2.5 million. It's reprehensible, it's not acceptable. That's somebody's business. That is not about protesting for BLM. That is just willful, absolute willful damage. So Black's stepfather has been concerned that the unrest actually may come to their home. So therefore, gets all the guns from the basement to keep them handy. Again, you can kind of understand that all he wants to do is protect his family, but there's a bit of me that just goes, oh, there is so many opportunities for error when you're worked up and convinced that somebody's coming for your family. And then equally, I completely understand that if horrible things are happening in your community, the only thing you're thinking about is your family and protecting them. But like I said, the room for error is big. Black also states later on that he was in the kitchen when Rittenhouse emerges from the basement with his rifle. So he comes up and he's got his rifle on him. They then head downtown around 5 p.m. And on the way, they buy tactical slings for their rifles. So they're obviously making sure that they're prepared if they need to use them. So earlier in the day, 25th of August, the demonstrations had been initially peaceful. However, again, things start to turn violent. So there are confrontations between demonstrators, armed civilians and police. And the unrest is fueled by the news of Jacob Blake's condition. He may never walk again. And that is very inflammatory. People are thinking, here we are, another black man who many people felt was treated unfairly in that situation has potentially had his whole life changed because of this incident. A further 125 National Guard members are deployed and the demonstrators begin to clash with police. This happens in the Civic Centre Park outside the courthouse. So around 10 p.m., armed people identifying themselves as militia begin patrolling businesses downtown. This is in direct contravention of the 8 p.m. curfew that has been imposed. So they are actually breaching that curfew. Also, just to note, militia groups are actually illegal throughout the US because, you know, they have people like the police who are meant to look after these scenarios. And they don't want random people just turning up in groups who are armed. They're a bit difficult to control. They might shoot people, things like that. But nonetheless, up they come, walking around in groups, calling themselves a militia. And despite authorities condemning vigilante behavior, there are some images that seem to suggest the condemnation was not as I would imagine condemnation. When I think about condemnation, I imagine a police officer saying, don't do that, I'm condemning you. Maybe lightly, or I'm dragging you off now in my van because you're a militia and you're illegal. That's the kind of condemnation I imagine. As opposed to the pictures where the images show police handing out bottled water to armed civilians. That doesn't feel condemning. One would say that's incentivizing and validating. Is it just me? Is that just me? Is it just me that that's incentivizing and validating? I mean, if people give you things for free, that's kind of an incentive, isn't it? For reward. Also, an officer is actually heard saying over a loudspeaker, we appreciate you being here. I'm not sure that's condemnation. I'm pretty sure that's actually being really positive and rewarding and suggesting that people are doing the right thing. I think that's what happened. Anyway, they were condemned. So the evening of the 24th of August, armed with a semi-automatic rifle and 30 round magazine, Rittenhouse and his group join the group of other armed men. They're all there to protect car source, car dealership. Now remember, the law in Wisconsin states 
only people aged 18 and over could carry a weapon. Rittenhouse is 17. Rittenhouse has also turned up in possession of a medical kit because he intends to help anyone injured in the unrest. And it's also captured on film that evening claiming to be an EMT, which is emergency medical treatment. Again, a bit of an issue with his age because he's too young to be certified as somebody who is an EMT. But I just kind of have this sympathy with him and I think he was just trying to be youthful. I mean, genuinely, I was on a plane once and somebody had a heart attack and they were asking for people who had first aid advice and guidance or some kind of certification or a doctor and there was not a doctor on the plane and I genuinely was trying to put my hand up to say well I can help because I had my bronze medallion and I used to do life-saving but genuinely on reflection if they said yeah I don't think putting them in the recovery position and blowing up their pajamas to put around them so that they could survive would have helped because they weren't in deep water but I did try I was very very helpful Fortunately, there was somebody more qualified who actually did help. But he's just acting in that way that a lot of kids do. He wants to be seen as useful. Now, like I said, we have this age issue and that's two problems. You know, he isn't old enough to be an EMT and he isn't old enough to be carrying that gun. So the car lot owner at this point, he shows them how to get inside if they need to and he shows them the ladder which they can use to set up the roof so people can sit up there and guard the environment. Also, sorry, I'm laughing at this point, because you know when you just gotta go. These people were obviously in a mindset where they were taking it very, very seriously, but the owner of the car lot basically deputizes them all. And I'm pretty sure that as much as this seems like a nice authoritarian thing to do, he wasn't in a position to actually deputize them. I'm not sure any of them were sheriffs. It's as simple as that. But he doesn't have the power to do that, does he? But it's just like revving up, isn't it, right? Not only are you now a militia, you're now deputised. You're basically legally allowed to enforce this, showing you the mindset. And also how group behaviour can often create this kind of, not madness, but this kind of over-amplified reaction to circumstances. Now, independent journalist Richie McGuinness also interviewed Rittenhouse that night. And during the interview, Rittenhouse states, people are getting injured. Our job is to protect this business. And part of my job is to help people. If there's someone hurt, I'm running to harm's way. That's why I have my rifle, because I have to protect myself. Obviously, I also have my med kit. So he's acknowledging that he is there to do good, but that he may come under fire, in which case he needs to ensure that he's protecting himself. Rittenhouse would also, later on, be caught on film by quite a lot of live streamers that night. This included Kristen Harris, the citizen journalist, and he also spoke to Rittenhouse and another man, Ryan Balk. Balk was a former member of the military from Jackson. He did have far-right ideology, very anti-establishment, and he'd heard about the Blake protests and decided that because he was near Kenosha, he was going to turn up. He was also armed with an AR-type rifle. He'd had to avoid the police roadblocks to even get into Kenosha that day. He then spotted an armed group at Car Source and said, I can offer you tactical expertise. So Balk and several others positioned themselves at one of the mechanic shops. Men with rifles set up on the roof. This included Rittenhouse's friend Black. And there were incidents of friction, confrontations between the armed men and passing protesters. Lots of protesters were constantly complaining that these guys who were on the roof were pointing laser sights at them. And the retaliation of this is they start throwing things at men on the roof. Again, not a good thing to do to a group of armed men who are pointing sights at your face. It's completely reprehensible of the men on the roof to do that. It's inciting fear. It's inciting threat, it's completely unnecessary, and it, in this case, provokes this kind of harm, this retaliation. But with respect, I would also argue that if you're a protester, it's really not a healthy thing to start trying to retaliate against armed people, particularly if those armed people are pumped up with adrenaline and believe that they are doing their duty by protecting this particular car lot. So bad behavior on both sides, as simple as that. Now, one of these protesters was 36-year-old local resident, Joseph Rosenbaum. 
He suffered from bipolar. He was on meds. He was also taking antidepressants. Now, just to give you some background on Rosenbaum, he was actually homeless when he met his fiancée, Carrie Ann Swart, in 2019. Carrie Ann would also have been homeless at the time and they'd been living in a motel together. He'd recently been charged with domestic violence and he'd also attempted suicide where he'd been admitted afterwards to a psychiatric ward in Milwaukee. He'd only been released hours before these riots were happening. In fact, he'd just been released to a point where he was still carrying his plastic bag, which contained the papers, socks, deodorant, toothbrush and toothpaste from the hospital. He basically wandered into the middle of chaos. He was in a very angry, very aggressive state and he was shouting at the gunman on the roof. I think we have to acknowledge this was a man who had just got released from a psychiatric hospital and clearly was in a state to some degree of distress and this was provoking this kind of reaction. Now at some point Rittenhouse appears on Harris's camera saying protesters were mixing ammonia, gasoline and bleach together and it's causing an ammonia bomb. So, you know, this is some high level stuff going down. It's not for the faint hearted. It's a dangerous situation to be in. And Rittenhouse then joins Balk on the ground. He wants to offer medical advice and aid to protesters. But just go with me on this, guys. Obviously, at this moment in time, this child, and he's 17, he is a kid. He's got really good intentions. Like he wants to protect things. He wants to help people medically. But think about somebody who's about to protect you, particularly if they're going to give medical aid to protesters. You're going to imagine somebody who looks like they're calm, that they know what they're doing, that they have the right resources with them. Think about seeing a 17 year old armed with an assault rifle. You're not going to look specifically protective are you in this moment in time particularly when you might see that individual because they're white as part of the militia who might be there to do you harm i'm not saying they were i'm just saying you might perceive that so rittenhouse goes out from car source but then gets split up from the people he's with and it's at this point rittenhouse's mum actually has a really bad feeling and she calls him and he says to her i'm doing medical so She's got that intuition, that mother's instinct, that this isn't gonna work out well and how right she was and how awful that in that moment, he didn't just think, maybe I'm gonna do what mum needs me to do and come home. When Kyle Rittenhouse tries to go back to the car source, he's actually stopped by the police, so he can't go back there. So he's now completely on his own, 17 in this scenario on his own. So that's gonna be scary. Now, sometime after 11 p.m., Black's friend, Nick Smith, receives a call. And that call informs him that vandals are attacking another car source mechanic shop a few blocks south. Basically, protesters and rioters are smashing car windows. And so then Rittenhouse is called and told by that group to go meet them there, that they're going to go and protect this car source. So Rittenhouse grabs a fire extinguisher from a petrol station and heads to 63rd Street. He's clearly trying to think on his feet about what's gonna be required at that car place. You know, he's taking a fire extinguisher with him. Again, that's a very protective mechanism. He wants to do good. Now en route, Rittenhouse gets involved in a confrontation with a group of people. A group of protesters have been expelled from the Civic Center Park because they've been clashing with police and they have gathered along Sheridan Road. To some degree, They've almost been herded by the police towards the car source lots. This includes Joseph Rosenbaum. He's unarmed at this point. He's got his t-shirt wrapped around his head, showing his torso. And the, a journalist, Richie McGuinness, actually witnesses the confrontation. So Rittenhouse approaches the car park. Rosenbaum is hiding at this point, And he begins to follow Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse becomes aware of this, tries to avoid him. And according to Rittenhouse, he says he realized that Rosenbaum was unarmed, but at the same moment, he hears Rosenbaum threaten to kill him. And a group of people actually start to pursue Rittenhouse. Rosenbaum also shouts, fuck you, and throws his plastic bag at him. Apparently Rittenhouse at this point shouts, friendly, friendly, friendly. And he had been friendly. He was trying to help people out. 
He wasn't wanting to get into confrontations with the protesters and rioters. He also did want to protect the car lot that he wanted to protect, but certainly he considered himself an ally. So he shouts friendly, 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 but Rosenbaum starts to chase him. At this point, a bystander fires warning shots into the air to distract. So Rittenhouse turns in that direction. Rosenbaum then takes this opportunity and lunges at Rittenhouse. He, in fact, attempts to take the rifle from him. Now, just put yourself in that position. You've got a guy who's just threatened your life. You've tried to let them know that you're friendly and you're suddenly being assaulted and now they're going for your gun. What would you do? Do you let that person take your gun? Do you fight back and try not to use your gun? Or do you just shoot? It's a difficult decision to make in that moment, isn't it? Because if he gets the gun, is it you who's going to get shot? Or is it if you fight, you're both going to get shot? Or do you just decide to go ahead and act out of the impulse and use that gun? And that's what he does. He fires four shots at close range. Rosenbaum is hitting the groin, the back, and his left hand. The bullets perforate Rosenbaum's heart, aorta, pulmonary artery and right lung, and they also fracture his pelvis. Richard McGuinness, the journalist who'd earlier interviewed Rittenhouse nearby, also narrowly avoided getting shot in that situation. He then tries to administer first aid, he even rips off his own shirt, he attempts to stem the blood flow, and at this point, when he's tending to Rosenbaum, he actually described that his breathing was like a horrifying growl. Now, Rittenhouse stays there, because obviously now there's a crime scene, for around half a minute, and he's constantly looking down at Rosenbaum. He doesn't attempt to help him, but McGuinness tells him to call 911. But instead he runs. He runs from that scene and he makes calls to his friend Black, and he just tells him, I've just killed somebody. He runs towards the police vehicles, but they don't stop. So then he basically runs back up Sheridan Road. Now he shouldn't have left the scene of that crime. He shouldn't have left a scene that could have been a crime scene and would be treated as a crime scene, at least until they find out what's happened. But again, he's 17 and he's probably very aware of a baying crowd and the potential of serious harm towards him. And he does what a lot of kids do, he runs. Now, 26 year old West Alice resident, Gage Crosscruz, who was live streaming, had heard gunfire. So Crosscruz was at the process basically to provide medical care. He'd been trained as a paramedic before switching to attend liberal arts college in Wisconsin. Now he had packed medical supplies and a handgun as he always did for demonstrations. Now less than a minute and a half after he hears that gunfire, he spots Rittenhouse running and there are other people running after him. And these people are like shouting for someone to stop him. They genuinely believe he's a dangerous shooter. He's already shot one person. Now by this point, Rittenhouse has also been struck in the back of the head by a protester. So he's obviously running for his life as far as he's concerned. And during that, he trips and falls shortly after near 61st Street and Sheridan Road. A running man then actually connects with him with a flying kick whilst he's still on the ground. And Rittenhouse retaliates and he fires two shots at him, but he misses. Immediately after this, another man, 26-year-old Silver Lake resident, Anthony Huber, rushes in holding his skateboard. Huber had been at the demonstration with his girlfriend and he actually knew Jacob Blake. So essentially he was there because he felt angry about a friend being paralyzed, etc. Now, according to his girlfriend's account, he genuinely believed that Rittenhouse was going to be a dangerous threat and that he was already a dangerous gunman who'd shown his potential. And he genuinely felt like he needed to bring him down. Now, she tries to stop him, but he just pulls away from her after seeing the armed teenager and he goes after him. Yeah, he knew there was danger, but he was one of those people who just constantly wanted to help. So because Huber had his skateboard, with him, he carried it everywhere basically. He obviously felt that he could use that. And it's also worth knowing that Huber had suffered from mental health problems in the past. And the reason that he had his skateboard with him was it had always been really therapeutic for him to go skateboarding and it helped him loads. So then he rushes in thinking that he's gonna protect people from this crazy gunman in his opinion. And he strikes Rittenhouse who's on the floor in the neck shoulder area with his skateboard. Then he grabs the end of the rifle because he's trying to disarm him. 
So briefly, as on top of Rittenhouse, the pair struggle for control of the rifle. Rittenhouse fires one shot as Huber rolls off him. It hits him directly in the chest. Huber stumbles forward a few paces and then just crumples to the ground. It perforates his heart and right lung and he dies shortly after at the scene. So that was just such a devastating blow for his family. I mean, this is a guy who genuinely was there for the right reasons at the protest and then all he was trying to do was, as far as he was concerned, disarm a man who he thought may be a lone shooter going around killing innocent people. That was the kind of picture he'd formed. And because of that and his heroism, albeit misplaced heroism, it meant that he ended up dead. Grosskreutz was also carrying a mobile phone and handgun. So at this point, they run at Rittenhouse as Huber is shot. Again, he stops a couple of feet away, covers his head with his hands. And he later testified that he believed Rittenhouse re-racked his rifle at this point and attempted to shoot, but the gun didn't actually fire. So then he proceeds towards Rittenhouse and Rittenhouse shoots him in the arm and actually severs his bicep muscle to a degree that he loses 90% of it. He then just obviously runs going off screaming for a medic because he's in terrible agony with his arm. So Rittenhouse then gets to running again and he runs towards the intersection where Kenosha police are in armoured vehicles because now he knows this has gone horribly wrong and he has killed two people, at least I imagine he thinks at this point he definitely has, and he's injured somebody else. Now at this point he walks towards the police with his hands in the air, his rifle swinging down by his waist, but the police just ignore him. Now the police ignore him because apparently they're responding to shots fired call. Well, if you'd paid attention, you would have noticed a guy with his hands in the air, with a rifle swinging down by his waist, approaching you as if to give himself up surrendering. But they're like, hey, it's just a white militia guy with his hands in the air. What damage could he do? He's a good guy. I imagine that was the bias that went on with respect. So they don't know at this point that Rittenhouse has been involved in the incident, but they even ignore calls from bystanders who are shouting that Rittenhouse is the person that needs to be arrested. But they just drive past him, just go past him towards the injured. In fact, one of the officers even says to him, can you get out of the road? Apparently, he even attempts to pepper stray Rittenhouse as Rittenhouse continues walking towards him. Now, witnesses would later state that after the shootings, Rittenhouse was nervous, pale and sweating, and he was repeatedly saying, I just shot somebody. So he wasn't victorious. He wasn't pumped up on adrenaline. He wasn't enjoying the situation and scenario at all. He was panicking. He was shocked. Black later finds him sitting on a chair in a shop. He's visibly shaken. And he drives him home across state lines to Antioch. His mother at this point gives him an ultimatum. You go to the police or you leave town. Completely understand that response, but probably just going to the police would have been the one that you should go for. I appreciate or leave town escape, but I think go to the police. If you go to the police, you seem a lot more innocent, don't you? With respect, if you leave town, it seems that you might be a felon on the run. Nonetheless, I'm a parent. If my child rang and said, I've murdered somebody, I may be the parent who says, I'll be there with the pigs in a lime and a spade shortly. I don't know. It can happen to the best of us. But about an hour to an hour and a half later, he turns himself in. It's about 1 a.m. in the morning. Apparently, when he turns himself in, he's vomiting and crying whilst he's waiting to speak to the officers. During the interview, he even asks the officers if they do him a favour and delete all his social media accounts. Very childish response to this, isn't it? This is a kid who suddenly has ultimately realised that he's changed his life forever. He gets arrested, he's taken into custody in Lake County, Illinois, and he's actually held at a juvenile facility in Vernon Hills. He's officially charged the next day. And he faced a plethora of various charges, so for killings, plus various weapon violations, so he got first degree reckless homicide, that's in relationship to Rosenbaum. First degree intentional homicide in relation to Huber. Attempted first degree intentional homicide, that's in relation to Grosskreutz. 
two counts of first degree recklessly endangering safety, possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under the age of 18, and failure to comply with an emergency order, i.e. the breaking of the curfew. The breaking of the curfew? The breaking of the curfew that the police didn't seem to be that condemning of? Okay, let's just get him done for breaking the curfew. Stroke being given free water and told that they're doing a good job and thank for your service, but nevertheless, why let that hold you back from slapping a failure to comply with an emergency order opportunity? Now, under Wisconsin law, anyone 17 or older is actually treated as an adult in the criminal justice system. So Rittenhouse was therefore going to be tried as an adult. The weapons possession charge actually got dismissed. The legislation relating to minors' possession of firearms was unclear, so the defence were really able to successfully argue that Wisconsin law only restricted minors from carrying rifles if they were short-barrelled. I mean, I love a good defence, obviously, but that seems like a bizarre law, doesn't it? What's that? You had a gun? You're under 18. You had a gun? Yeah? Seriously damaging gun? Right, you did. You had one, but you're 17. You're not allowed one. Yes, I am. But it had a long barrel. Oh. That is fine! That got dropped. Anyway, Rittenhouse's friend Dominic Black did actually get charged with two counts of providing a firearm to a minor, which resulted in death. Because, you know, chain of causation, Rittenhouse should never have had access to that gun. Now, the Conservatives and far-right figures start raising money for Rittenhouse's defence via hashtag FightBacks website. This is criticised by lots of people, but it meant that he could afford private counsel, and John Pierce ended up representing him. He'd actually already represented several really high-profile clients, and he told the media that Rittenhouse was a minute man protecting his community when the government would not. He would actually later be fired by Rittenhouse, who would basically say that he had set him up to pose for photos with far-right extremists, which obviously would look dreadful for him in this circumstance. Rittenhouse was extradited to Wisconsin on the 30th of October 2020, and the bail was set at $2 million. He was released on the 20th of November because the bail was posted from hashtag fight back donations. Now, Many criticised a system that could allow a double homicide suspect to leave custody. And obviously, I understand those kind of feelings because this is a guy who essentially, as far as the public are concerned, may have murdered innocent people at this point. That is the narrative that is certainly being put out there in the press. The idea that this individual has been allowed to walk free is going to cause concern. So when he leaves... Rittenhouse drives to Indiana basically to join his family. They're all in a safe house because they've received lots of death threats imminently after the shootings. Totally reprehensible. Don't get it, me. Don't get it. Oh, this person is accused of killing people. You know what we need to do? We need to threaten to kill the family. There is no just killing in this way. The idea that you put yourself in a separate position because you feel you've got justice on your side Firstly, when you don't know the facts, and secondly, when you're blaming innocent individuals who've had nothing to do with the killings, that is bizarre psychology. It really is. And it's completely inappropriate that anybody believes that threatening an innocent family member is an acceptable move to make to the point where they actually get moved to a safe house. That's just psychological destruction for that family per se. Now, remember, there are videos of Rittenhouse on the night of the killings. So these have now gone viral. And that means that they're very easy to target as a family. And one of the big accusations is that they've created a white supremacist son, which they haven't. And there's no evidence, not at the beginning, the middle or the end, the evidence that he's a white supremacist. So that's a complete false narrative. Now, the night that Rittenhouse is reunited with his family, actor Ricky Schroeder visits them. They actually end up posing for photographs together, and these photographs end up on Twitter. Now, Rittenhouse is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee Company t-shirt, and the coffee company is owned by an ex-serviceman. So that t-shirt has basically been given to him purely by security, who had driven him to a safe house. So 
there'd been an ex-Navy SEAL hired to look after the family. And because he's wearing this, even though the public aren't aware, it's just been handed to him. There's no choice that he's made. He's just put it on because he was given it him on his release. That then gets this whole story added to it. So loads of people are condemning the photo and saying it's in terrible taste. But again, all it takes is for one tweet to go out. Believe me, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I know. There's a few tweets that I've put out that have ended up in the news. You know, if you read the rest of them, that makes sense. But if you just take one of them, you might suggest I'm suggesting breaking rules, for example, when we're not allowed to. But this is the nature of social media. It's fast paced, it's highly destructive at times, and it can mean that one photo can change the way that a whole population views you. And this is the problem when this gets uploaded online. Now, at the same time, Rittenhouse and his family launched this website because they need to raise money to make sure that Rittenhouse has a decent defense. So they basically start selling free Kyle merchandise and it also features slogans like, self-defense is a right, not a privilege. You can get a hoodie, $39.99, or a bikini, $42.99. I'm just gonna say, completely, irrespective of what we're talking about, a hoodie really should be more expensive than a bikini. There's a lot more work and material goes into a hoodie in my opinion. And I don't understand why there's a $3 distinction between that, but that's just my mind going down there. What's a bargain, what's not? I would have gone for neither. But if I had to, I'd have chosen the hoodie because you know, it's warmer and it can cover more of your body. And also I don't ever wear bikinis, they're ridiculous things, at my age at least. So they're obviously, ramming up this kind of opportunity to capitalize because they need to make money. But that doesn't go down well either because people feel that they're profiting from the shootings. And again, remember, let's put ourselves in the position of the family for a moment. They're not really thinking about what people are thinking of them. They're thinking about how the hell do we protect our child? How do we raise money to ensure that they've got a good defense? Because it's very, very expensive to have that kind of private attorney. Now, the 5th of January, 2021, Rittenhouse pleads not guilty to all charges. The pretrial hearings are via Zoom due to the bloody pandemic. Now, after hearing, they go to Pudge's bar and he's actually filmed drinking with his mother. He changed out of his court clothes and he was now wearing a t-shirt with a slogan, free as fuck. Do I think that was a good choice? No. I don't know who was advising him. I have no issue with him going and drinking with his mother. I imagine that he was very stressed. I imagine she was very stressed. I imagine that being together was really important at that moment in time and going and having a drink together, completely forgivable. But I think wearing a t-shirt with a slogan free as fuck is in bad taste. Now, whilst he was there, he poses for pictures with five men who sang Proud of You Boy. It's an anthem of the far right, Proud Boys organization. Now that is a hate group. In one photograph, Rittenhouse made an okay gesture with his hand. Now, this is a gesture used by the far right. These organizations and white supremacists use it as imagery. And of course, when people saw those pictures, he gets criticized for it. But all he says he'd done is notice that one of the other men had done it and he followed suit. He later said he had absolutely no idea of the racist connection. You have to make of what you will from that. But like I said, historically, there is absolutely nothing to suggest that he's far right in any way, shape or form. And it is not unusual in circumstances where you're being supported to mimic the individual who's supporting you as a level of thanking them for doing it. It's showing gratitude and respect. He didn't realize that the song that was being sung was very much against the black population or any population that isn't white, essentially. But that was something that, again, online looks terrible and adds fuel to the fire. So the trial starts on the 1st of November. Rittenhouse claims he'd acted in self-defense and his defense team claim it was Joseph Rosenbaum who had actually been the aggressor, that he had been the one to spark the violence that led to his own death. Now the prosecution, of course, they say, no, you're wrong. Rittenhouse was the aggressor. He was an armed threat. He'd left two men for dead and one with life-changing injuries. And all Rittenhouse suffered was a half-inch scratch above his eyebrow, a small cut inside his lower lip, a two-inch scratch below his collarbone, a two-inch scratch on his forearm, a scratch on his back, and two small bumps on the head. 
So his injuries were nowhere near the severity of those he bestowed on the victims. So Dominic Black, Rittenhouse's close friend who'd actually supplied him the gun, was the first witness called by the prosecution. And he stated that Rittenhouse had expressed interest in one of his rifles and that he'd later bought a gun for him as Rittenhouse was underage. He also admitted that they discussed the fact that it was illegal, so they both knew it was illegal because it was an offence to supply a gun to someone under the age of 18. Black had agreed to keep the gun at his house until Rittenhouse turned 18. And with respect, that's clearly a case because they were locked up, the guns, in Black's house. His father was the person who had access to them. So though I imagine that was the intention. They do admit that after buying the rifle, they'd shot 200 rounds, but that this was the only time Rittenhouse had used the gun prior to the shootings on the 25th of August, 2020. Black stated, he didn't want to be in the mix on the night of the shootings. He wanted to keep out the danger zone, so he remained on the garage roof. He just hoped that the rifle he was holding would deter potential vandals. So he was saying, I was there, I wanted to be there, but I certainly didn't want to be in a situation where I might get harmed, which is why I chose to be on this roof. Other witnesses, well, they testified to having seen Rosenbaum taunt the group of armed men. That was including Rittenhouse, and that he'd been behaving really violently prior to the shootings. Ryan Bulk, who was with Rittenhouse on that night, said, Rosenbaum shouted at them, if I catch any of you guys alone tonight, I'm going to fucking kill you. The defense team, well, they played videos and they showed images of a really angry Rosenbaum confronting people earlier in the night. Remember though, he was really mentally ill. He'd recently tried to kill himself. He'd been admitted to a psychiatric ward as a result. And I, I do feel that this is a bit like victim blaming because this guy had obviously had serious issues. Again, I'm not defending his behavior at all, but I'm saying that this was a very high octane experience that was happening. The guy had just got out of a psych ward. We don't know whether he'd taken his tablets. And yes, he obviously was acting in a way that wasn't acceptable, but he certainly wasn't asking to get shot. Nonetheless, it's understandable that that's how the defense are gonna bring it out because they are claiming self-defense. Rittenhouse takes a stand, gives evidence in his own defense. He absolutely vehemently denies intending to kill Rosenbaum. The court actually had to be adjourned because he breaks down crying, really, really, upset when he's describing the incidents which lead to the shootings and the fact that they had to adjourn the court because he was in such a state really does demonstrate it and without a doubt if you watch him breaking down it's clear he's feeling what he's feeling he isn't a psychopath they're real tears he looks like he's about to vomit he claims that Rosenbaum had twice threatened to kill him that night and then he'd been ambushed in the car park he said he was threatened he was chased he was ambushed by the people he shot he said that Rosenbaum threatened him and tried to grab his gun. Huber hit him with a skateboard and grabbed his gun and Grosskreutz was carrying a pistol and lowering it towards his head. He actually stated in court, I didn't intend to kill them. I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. I did what I had to do to stop the person who was attacking me. Now the prosecution claimed he'd instigated confrontations with protesters. Rittenhouse denied this. He said, I was there to protect properties and provide medical assistance to injured protesters. In fact, he said he wanted to turn himself in after shooting Rosenbaum. He wasn't seeking confrontation when he was attacked. He said, I didn't do anything wrong. I defended myself. After four days of the jury deliberating, they unanimously found Rittenhouse not guilty of all charges. As not guilty verdicts were read out to each count, it was so obvious that Rittenhouse was becoming more and more emotional. In fact, when the last not guilty verdict was announced, he just briefly collapsed back onto the seat and put his head on the table. He attempted to stand, but he couldn't. He actually had to be helped back into his seat by a court official. He's visibly shaking. They gave him water. You know, this is an 18 year old young man and potentially had been looking at serving the rest of his life in prison without parole. He also hugs his attorney at this point. Now, I said I was going to be neutral, and I am, because public opinion has been massively polarised on this verdict. Many, and I mean many, feel that justice has been served. Because in the States, 
The law upholds a person's right to defend themselves with lethal force where necessary. As far as he was concerned, he'd fired only when he was attacked. But many others felt very differently. They said that Rittenhouse had gotten away with murder. They claimed he'd gone to the protest just looking for trouble. They acknowledged that he was too young to even possess the weapon and he had no business being there as far as they were concerned and that he'd acted both criminally and recklessly. Joe Biden, he says he stands by the jury's decision. Donald Trump, he congratulates Rittenhouse on the verdict and he released a statement, if that's not self-defense, nothing is. This support being noted, Rittenhouse's public image did get damaged a little bit further because there was a video that was filmed four weeks before the shootings with his sister Mackenzie on the waterfront. She basically got into a fight with another girl and Rittenhouse repeatedly punched her from behind to a point where members of the public had to intervene. So that in effect is not a good PR demonstration, is it? That this guy literally punched a girl I mean, that's a really bad day for any man, whether you're protecting your sister or otherwise, you don't lay your hands on a girl, you know? There are opportunities such as calling the police and getting that individual brought to justice, but that shows some pretty poor emotional regulation and impulse control. Nonetheless, like I said, it's something that's done the rounds and I'm sure it's something that he probably regrets massively now with the response of the general public. Now to conservatives, Rittenhouse is a patriotic hero. They also emphasized that Joseph Rosenbaum had actually served more than 10 years for child molestation. You know, he'd been sexually abused himself as a child. And there are even memes that have been spread online saying, oh, I shot a pedophile, my bad. I know that we have a sarcastic sense of humor in the world, but even though this individual is reprehensible in his abuse of children, without a doubt, I don't think it still is a justification for him being killed. You know, at the end of the day, we always have to be aware that there is a very fine line when we start talking about just killing. And certainly a member of the public is not responsible for being able to do that. Now, if we put politics aside for a minute, it could well be that in this whole case with Rittenhouse, it was just a kid with good intentions. He was naive. He got himself into a really dangerous situation and he was undoubtedly really scared. He was in fear of his life and because of that, he reacted with lethal force. Also, I'm going to acknowledge, it was not his fault that he was made a far-right poster boy. He had absolutely no connections to such ideologies. Even when you think about his time on the Police Explorer program, that psychologically may have given him some false confidence. You know, when you look at the brochure for the program, it actually states, like police officers, explorers must be ready and willing to encounter any emergency situations such as first responders to accidents or injuries. So had he taken that incredibly seriously and felt emboldened to act in this way? I think this case more significantly, however, demonstrates the difference in the US law enforcement's treatment of white and black people. Just think about why these riots began. Jacob Blake, a black man, was shot multiple times in the back for carrying a knife, right? Multiple times in the back for carrying a knife. Even if the officer in the situation where he was shot was afraid, seven shots does seem excessive, even to a lackey like me. Now, I will say that Shesky stated that he had been trained to continue firing until the threat had been neutralized. And therefore he only stopped shooting when Blake dropped the knife. But still, I think that's excessive. Meanwhile, however, Kyle Rittenhouse, white teenager, moments after reports of shots fired, literally walked up to the police with his hands in the air in possession of a semi-automatic rifle and he gets ignored despite the fact that the crowd around him are saying he'd shot people and needed to be arrested instead he was just left and allowed to then return home now ask yourself this would they have driven past a black man in the same situation now, the police stressed that they'd been unaware it was a shooting incident 
and it was also in the midst of a dangerous, stressful scenario. You know, there was protesting, there was rioting. Also, they could hear multiple shots being shot in different directions and locations. What the police have said is that actually, as far as they're concerned, it isn't that uncommon for armed people to walk towards them with their hands up during the riots, presumably because they're armed and they want the police to know that they're not a threat. So arguably, maybe they use that stereotype and bias to ignore what the crowd was saying. Now, according to a recent Harvard study, black people are more than three times as likely to be shot and killed during a police encounter. Three times. That's really scary. Because why would black people be ending up dead three times more than white people in similar encounters? I mean, that in itself, reeks of a need to reform the way that individuals are treated. You know, these are people who have a different pigment in their skin. How does that lead to them being allowed to die so more frequently than their white counterparts? Now, the figures regarding fatalities from guns is pretty big in the States. It really is. In Rittenhouse's home state of Illinois, in 2017 alone, there was over 1,500 firearm fatalities. Almost 1,000 were homicides and over 500 were suicides. Because we all have bad times, don't we? That's one of the reasons as well that it's good that we don't have guns in the UK. Because when you're having a bad time, you have access to things like that, it can lead to some pretty bad impulse decisions. Illinois' firearm homicide rate is only the sixth highest in the state. So there are five states that have higher levels of these fatalities. Since 2017, firearms like Rittenhouse's high velocity rifle have been used in at least 13 mass shooting incidents. Now, according to a theory of social psychology called the weapons effect, the mere sight of a gun inspires aggression. And a study in the UK concluded that people are more likely to assault an officer in possession of a taser. So when we see weapons, it almost primordially alerts us to this attack potential and makes us more violent. So regardless of who's armed, it seems that people are more likely to interpret things in a hostile way if somebody has an arm of some sort, taser, gun, knife. Because I guess, if you just put it down to the rudimentary term, armed people don't make you feel safe. They make you feel threatened. In fact, when I walk through train stations and there are armed police, I instantly feel afraid. I just do. I'm like, there are guns and people in power with them, and I don't like that feeling. And the research suggests that they do indeed incite violence. Now, in the US before 1994, there was an estimated 400,000 AR 15 style semi automatic rifles. Today, following expiration of 10 year bans, that means because of the multiple mass shootings and the bans that occurred, there are now 20 million AR-15 style weapons. 20 million. And on top of this insane escalation in such weapons, to add to the issue, 30 states have adopted stand your ground laws. These are laws that reinforce civilian use of lethal force. Now those very pro the second one amendment claim if Rittenhouse hadn't had the gun, he'd be dead. But I guess that what they seem to miss the point around is that if he hadn't had the gun, he wouldn't have been attacked. None of this tragedy would have actually happened, would it? It was the fact that there was a white kid running down the streets with a really dangerous weapon that made protesters believe that he was a threat and that caused the retaliation. And the reason I say that is because even with Rosenbaum, what he did was very much around the fact that he'd seen this white kid with a gun and it provoked a reaction. Yes, he'd been violent earlier, but he hadn't killed anyone. So therefore we could argue that his behavior prior to this had not been a good citizen level, but certainly hadn't suggested he was about to murder anybody. It was the gun that caused the provocation and certainly the research also evidences this support wise, it really does. You see somebody with a gun, you're gonna feel a threat, it's gonna provoke that defensive reaction and chances are that person is gonna get into an altercation and that's what happened.
So again, I'm not here to say the Second Amendment is wrong. I know that in the States, people very much want their guns, and I also understand historically why that exists. I'm just acknowledging the facts. And the facts are in this circumstance, the chances are that Rittenhouse, one, shouldn't have been there, he was under 18. Two, if he hadn't been armed, it wouldn't have occurred. There were lots of protesters there who weren't killing each other. And most importantly, that we need to learn from this. We need to learn from this. I genuinely think that we have to respect the jury's decision. I also think it's really important to stick to the facts and not the fiction because there has been a lot about this case. And once again, I also think we all need to realize that what goes on social media can have a major impact on the way that people consider who we are. The most important thing here is to remind everybody, Rittenhouse is not a far white poster boy. He doesn't wanna be, it isn't helpful making him so, and the reality is that nobody should be celebrating the deaths of anybody. It doesn't matter whether it was self-defense or otherwise people died and at least one of those individuals who died was actually a hero in this moment and to lose a hero from our society it's a regrettable incurment. I hope you found that quite neutral. I didn't want to say my own thoughts and feelings about this. I just wanted to stick with what the facts are because there's been so much hyperbole out there and so much propaganda. It just isn't helpful for our society. I think that the most important part of this is we have to acknowledge that black people, particularly men in the States, are far more at risk of dying in altercations similar to their white counterparts. And that is just unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And it's something that spanks of the fact that we need to do more work around bringing communities together and making law enforcement recognise that these stereotypes and biases are dangerously unhelpful and result in people losing their lives. Thanks for joining me. Let me know what you think about this. Tell me if you know any extra bits that I've missed out. Like I said, I've stayed away from all of the propaganda and amplifications and myths and I've just stuck to the facts. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know, give me a comment, give me a like. Subscribe if you haven't done. I put a lot of work into these. Remember I release content on a Wednesday and a Sunday and if you want to support me on Patreon, the link's below. Also, my merch has been released, so if you fancy it, have a look. The link will be below. Take care, guys. See you again soon.